Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. It has been five years since the magnitude 9 earthquake that triggered a devastating tsunami hit Fukushima, Japan. The tsunami itself swept over towns and villages, flattening 400,000 homes and buildings and killing more than 15,000 people, making it Japan's worst peacetime disaster. Because the tsunami damaged the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, it caused a major meltdown and became the world's worst nuclear catastrophe since the 1986 Chernobyl incident. My guest is Arnie Gunderson. He's just finished a one-month tour of Japan where he met with Fukushima evacuees. He sits on the board of directors of Fairwinds Energy Education. He has more than 40 years of nuclear power engineering experience. He was the recipient of a prestigious Atomic Energy Commission Fellowship for his master's degree in nuclear engineering, and he holds a nuclear safety patent. He was a licensed reactor operator and former nuclear industry senior vice president. During his nuclear power industry career, Arnie Gunderson managed and coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants in the United States. Welcome to Uprising, Arnie. Hey, thank you for having me. Well, your bio obviously uh, makes it seem like you know what you're talking about when it comes to nuclear reactors and and how these uh, these things work. So let's talk about your tour uh, through Japan first. How You were there for a month. Who did you meet and what sorts of conversations did you have with people? You know, there, there was a, a lot of really sad conversations. So I met with a lot of the people who were... Uh, who were forced to leave and are now in um, um, essentially giant trailer parks. Um, I, I met with the most memorable one was I met with 22 women in a 66 um, um, trailer trailer park. And uh, um, it was amazing. We were the first people in five years to ever talk to them about radiation. What? I mean, I mean does yeah. that include the Japanese government? That neither the Japanese government nor Tokyo Electric ever talked to them about radiation. Oh my goodness! And yet they're off their land; they're unable to ever return, and um, um, they know nothing. It was amazing. It was so sad. Lots of uh, lots of stories of the the smells and the 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 skin lesions they developed. And and uh, we had one woman who um, lost her hair. She had speckles all over her skin. She had a bloody nose. And, the, um, and her doctor told her it was stress, and she believed it. Uh, the inhumanity of the Japanese government toward its own people is just amazing. What did the situation look like? Did you actually go to Fukushima? Well, I, I saw it from a distance. Mm -hmm. uh, we asked Tokyo Electric if I could come in, and they uh, declined to respond. So... Um, I was about um, uh, half a mile away at the closest. You know that the entire mountain range. There's about there's a mountain range about eh, you know 20 miles inland, sort of like the the, the west coast of, of the U.S. You know, you've got a, a coastal plain, and then inland you've got a mountain range, and the entire mountain range is is contaminated. We found um, radioactive wild boar. You know, a hunter had killed a wild boar and we put a radiation detector on the meat and it was it was peg in the scale and then um, we found uh, they have wild monkeys in their mountains and um, one of the guys I was with followed a monkey and uh, and collected its droppings and the droppings were astronomically radioactive and I crawled out in a farmer's field and measured uh, cow flop and I had the same experience so radiation is everywhere you know, uh, it's so interesting. I was looking at a study that was just done this week, a British study. A team of ex experts from four British universities developed a series of tests to examine the relocations after the Fukushima crisis and see if the massive amount of expense uh, was worth the cost in terms of how many additional months or years uh, people's lives were extended by. And what mm -hmm. they found was that... Um, the average lifespan ex was extended by about only eight months um, in, in doing the relocation. And the, essentially, the group of researchers assessed that the cost of relocation and the fact that, you know, many thousands of, of elderly people died simply from the stress of relocation, that they said it wasn't worth it. 
<laughs> yeah, I absolutely disagree with that. Mm. You know, there's for for two reasons. First off, there's the fact that the the cost is uh, borne by Tokyo Electric, and the risk is borne by the hundred thousand people who have to leave. So, you know, I don't see any Tokyo Electric executives bringing their people, bringing their families in for cheap real estate. But the the more important thing is that. All of these studies are grossly underestimating the uh, the risk, and they're they're using this model that's based on a um, a 30 year old man um, who was exposed to a burst of radiation from an A bomb, um, and all of the models go back to that. But women and children are 20 times more radiosensitive. So even if you accept that eight month uh, life increase for 150,000 people. That's a lot. But then if you say, well, half of them were women and, and, uh, uh, and another quarter were, um, were children. So um, um, the actual life extension, if you will, to my way of thinking, is astronomical. Hmm. And I, also it's an average, right? So there are individuals who might get, you know, cancer uh, when they ordinarily might not have and die earlier. And so for an, at an individual level, the cost between, you know, dying 10, 20 years before you should from cancer versus not is pretty significant too. No, you're absolutely right. Hmm. You know, we had a, a, a lot of cases where... Uh, um, people told us that their doctors were uh, were covering up the the um, radiation symptoms. We had one doctor come forward and say that whenever he diagnosed a patient with a radiation related illness, the uh, Japanese government refused to pay his bill. Wow! And they put a, they put him out of business. So with that kind of uh, of pressure on the medical community. It's hard to get uh, to get good epidemiological data about what these people are uh, are getting ill from. So, if you want to stay in business as a doctor, you basically have to underdiagnose or misdiagnose radiation related illnesses. Wow. Yes, you know, like that woman I told you, her hair is falling out, she's got a bloody nose, uh, etc., and they're telling her it's stress. Hmm. Oh, you know, I'm I'm sorry, it's it's not. So, you're absolutely right. The pressure on the medical community. Um, is astronomical to downplay the significance of this. I was reading the uh, a part of a report that that um, you wrote uh, describing walls of black plastic bags containing highly toxic radioactive waste have been left in fields along highways and beside country roads without plans for permanent disposal. This this just I'm n- I have not heard this anywhere else. Tell us about this. Oh, geez, it's amazing. They have. 30 million bags. And these aren't your, you know, the bag you take out to your trash. Each one of these bags weighs a ton. So they've got 30 million bags of radioactive material. So in um, terms of like so soil that they kind of uh, confiscated? Uh, or Yes. Hmm. A lot of it is, uh, you know, they're hand scrubbing rocks and collecting the, uh, the material that they get off the rocks. They're going through lawn clippings and people's... Uh, uh, roofs and stuff like that. Also, what, like, like contaminated clothes that, that people are yes. using? Hmm. Contaminated clothes, contaminated uh, biological material, whether it's you know trees. Some of the trees were so contaminated, uh, they were afraid that they, uh, in the event of a fire, they would go airborne. Oh. Uh, all that radiation would go airborne. So they just, um, they just cut the trees down and and and, um, and ground them up, and sooner or later they're going to figure out something to do with all this radioactive material. And so let's also talk about the fact that uh, Japan is going to be hosting the 2020 Olympics. This is going to be, of course, in Tokyo, not Fukushima. But does the Japanese government really fear that the that any kind of realistic assessment of the impacts of Fukushima will in turn um, have a bearing on you know their reputation as a as a host of the Olympics at the very least? Well, hosting the Olympics was certainly a marketing ploy to take people's minds off of the disaster. You might recall that back in 2011, 2012, um, Prime Minister Abe was saying that the uh, radiation was contained and everything was under control. And based on his assurances, the, uh, the Olympic Committee gave Japan the, uh, the Summer Olympics. 
But that was a marketing ploy. You know, if you just looked at, here's the New York Times and Reuters and on and on um, on the anniversary of the accident, saying that this is this not under control. Um, so he said what he needed to say to get the Olympics, and I think they're um, they're hoping that people's minds will be uh, taken off the disaster. So, uh, Arnie, let's talk about uh, the lessons for the United States. Uh, climate change, we know, is uh, escalating. In fact, there is there's a new NASA report this week. I mean, we, we're seeing every indication that climate change is um, happening even faster than scientists predicted. What this, of course, does is it creates disruptive uh, climate that makes existing nuclear reactors, even ones that may not be active, um, very vulnerable, even more vulnerable, um, just as the in Fukushima Daiichi power plant was vulnerable to a tsunami that uh, aren't we going to be seeing or uh, having greater likelihood of severe climate patterns um, risking our nuclear uh, plants here in the United States? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great observation. You know, when, they, when engineers go back over um, the, the weather-related records, they go back um, maybe 100 years and they say, well, the worst flood was and the the worst hurricane was, and the worst, uh, um, you know, whatever the natural phenomenon was, is based on the last hundred years of data. But in the last 10 years, you can throw all that data out the window. There's a couple of plants that come to mind. Um, the the uh, one in New Jersey, which is um, Hope Creek, um, I'm sorry, Oyster Creek, rather. Um, that's the one that Sandy hit. And they were within six inches of flooding the cooling pumps that they thought had been protected from a thousand year event. You know, so these thousand year events keep coming at a much more uh, increased frequency than you'd ever expect. Another one's down in Florida, it's Turkey Point. Uh, it got hit by a tornado uh, oh, about a decade ago, and all of the off site communications were lost for, for three months. So, yes, climate change is jeopardizing um, nuclear plants around the country and around the world. And so what needs to happen now? Are people paying attention to the lessons from Fukushima, particularly given that the Japanese government is trying to downplay it so much? It seems as though, you know, when people like yourself are speaking out about what is really happening in Fukushima, um, you are often written off as a conspiracy theorist. Uh, you know, all the stu- like the study that I mentioned, there have been so many studies sort of downplaying the impacts of Fukushima so that people who are speaking up like yourself appear to be exaggerating. You know, there's so much money on the other side of this argument. Uh, you know, I, th- I think we have, we have the people on one side and the moneyed interests on the other. The, the banks in Japan have been uh, doling out billions and billions of dollars to keep the um, 50 nuclear plants that are, uh, are still potentially viable keep their employees on the payroll for five years. What business would do that unless they knew they were going to get their money back? You know, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't open a, a grocery store and then say, hey, guys, I'm going to pay you all for the next five years even though we have no customers. Well, the Japanese banks are behind a lot of, the, uh, uh, a lot of these issues because they've given the money away anticipating that sooner or later these plants are going to, be, uh, uh, are going to start back up. Where did they get that promise from? They got that promise from the Japanese government. I think the inhumanity of the Japanese government toward its own people has just been appalling. Hmm. Well, uh, where can people find out more information? Can you give out the website for the uh, Fairwinds um, Energy Education Organization? Yeah, thank you. It's Fairwinds, F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S. It's the old English spelling, fairwinds.org. And we have a great website, Uh, something like 11 million people have visited it. And um, uh, we are the go-to source in Japan as well for reliable information. We're the biggest website in Japan for reliable information. And we'll post a link to that from uprisingwithsonali.com later today. Arnie, thank you so much for joining us. All right. Thank you very much for having me.
My guest is Arnie Gunderson. He sits on the board of directors of Fairwinds Energy Education. He has more than 40 years of nuclear power engineering experience and has managed and coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants in the United States. He just finished a one-month tour of Japan. This is Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. Anna Bus is our assistant producer. Our theme music is by Ketsal. You can like us at facebook.com slash uprising radio and follow us at Twitter. Twitter.com slash Uprising Radio. Our website is uprisingwithsonali.com. If you're a listener to our Southern California station KPFK and would like to listen to Uprising with Sonali five days a week, simply tune in to kpfa.org in the 8 to 9 a.m. hour and listen to the live stream. This program airs Mondays and Tuesdays on KPFK and Monday through Friday on KPFA. Our website is uprisingwithsonali.com. I'm Sonali Kohatkar, host, audio engineer, and executive producer of Uprising. I'll see you next time.